Hello. Hi. Hi. On the other side of the screen. Uh, my name is Max Linsky. I am a co-founder of Pineapple Street Studios, which is a podcast company based in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, and I have two panelists with me here today. I was wondering if uh, if you two would introduce yourselves. Who is Jenna? Okay, I'll go first. Um, I am Lizzie Denahan, and I sit in a sales role, um, working, having the pleasure to work with Jenna and Max on the pineapple side, um, as well as Cadence 13, um, two sister podcast networks under the Entercom umbrella. Um, and I'm Jenna. I'm the co-founder along with Max of Pineapple Street. And um, all both of our companies, Cadence 13 and Pineapple, were acquired by Entercom uh, just about one year ago. Um, so we've spent some lovely time in Philly uh, hanging out with, with them. Uh, and we look forward to getting back to Philly at some point in the next four to seven years. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we are here today to talk a little bit about um, how our two companies responded to uh, the pandemic. And I was wondering if we could start. I'm just going to, for our purposes here, I'm just going to pretend like I don't know the answers to some of these questions. Uh, but I'm wondering if we could start with going back in time, like maybe the last week of March, and if you two could give me a sense of how you were feeling about podcasting in the early days of, of the uh, of the quarantine, how do you think we'll go? Sure. So I would say in the latter part of March, I think we were all still feeling a bit naive. Um, I myself gave my family a little calendar for two weeks, two week quarantine, and we will be back out there in the world. And that's certainly not how things unfolded. So um, from a business perspective and in mid-March, late March, I think we were all just trying to figure out how we get through the next couple of weeks. And then once late March hit, I think we understood a little bit what the challenges and struggles would be. Um, and then I think we also saw what the potential opportunity could be in that um, while we were all home, it also gave us this opportunity to go in and reflect and think about content and think about um, the privilege that we were in to put together uh, impactful pieces that were going to make a difference. Um, and I think we are, we're certainly still in that in some ways. And I think um, what it's afforded us to do is allowed us to tap into uh, storytellers and voices who um, were used to living a very, very busy life with a lot of travel. Um, and it gave us access to those types of people in a different way. And we've been able um, to tap into them and their talents and um, partner with them to produce some um, excellent content, in our opinion. That is a very positive take on late March. <laughs> Thank My you. At least, at least at Pineapple, uh, it was like a little bit more existential than that. <laughs> yeah. What, what is, what's your recollection? <laughs> we lost our minds a bit. Um, we, <laughs> we, I mean, it wasn't a happy time late March. Uh, I think that we thought that we just didn't, we, we thought that the world was crumbling, which it sort of has and, and is. Um, but uh, I, I think we called like everyone we'd ever worked with and said like, do you still want to work with us? Just making sure. Um, we were just really worried about what this would mean for business generally, um, not necessarily for podcasting, but just for mostly for the business of podcasting. Um, and pretty quickly, we, we realized that actually there was there was going to be an even kind of bigger podcast boom during this time because so many um, brands and interesting people um, who people, a lot of people from the film and TV worlds uh, were having to kind of shift their budgets out of those things and into something else. So we started quickly hearing probably like early April, we started hearing from just tons of brands um, that wanted uh, brand podcasts because they had shifted all their money out of, um, out of video, uh, which was interesting. It was not, not something we expected. Um, and then 
it just turned out that podcasting was something that we were able to do even in this crazy time. Um, it was a little annoying at first. We had to sort of figure out how to do like remote setups with everyone. And we kind of, um, we were like doing Zoom meetings where we were having people set up like home recording studios uh, while we talked them through it on Zoom. It was a bit like telling my mom how to like use uh, a computer. It was not, it was hard at times, um, but we figured it out. And we've been we're now making more shows than ever kind of by far um, and hiring lots of people to help us. Uh, so it's it, it turned into something that business-wise, for us at least, um, was pretty positive in the end. Yeah, I mean, m my memory of it was that there were there were sort of big unknowns on the business side, and then there were also just big unknowns on the production side. Like in late March, I think it was not totally clear that we would be able to make keep making shows, and uh, part of that was about trying to help you know, our parents set up the Wi-Fi signal in their house on Zoom to get them recording. But part of it was also just, it, it was unclear whether it was going to be an environment in which we could actually do creative work, you know, where we could generate new ideas. And then pretty early on um, at Pineapple, we sort of uh, one of our producers, a guy named Eric Mendel, a senior producer uh, who has an incredible track record in podcasting, came up with this idea for a kid show. Um, and we put it together really, really quickly. We ended up hearing from hundreds of kids from all over the world. Maybe we could play that trailer quickly. That would be slide six. Slide six. My name is Max. You probably know why we're all at home. Anyway, that was the beginning of the trailer. Uh <laughs> My name is Max. You probably know why we're all at home. We're trying to be smart. See, these are the kind of technical difficulties that we were encountering. My name is Max. You probably know why My we're all at home. My name is Max. Okay, I think we should, we should, we can let it go with it. <laughs> I don't think it's working. Uh, <laughs> My name is Max. You probably know why we're all at home. We're trying to be smart and be safe to keep everybody healthy and slow down this new germ you keep hearing about, the coronavirus. But we all still need stuff to do while we're sitting around. And there's only so many times I can listen to guys sing Old Town Road. Yay! I'm gonna take my horse to the Old Town Road. I'm gonna ride till I can't no more. So we asked all you kids to help out to make podcasts while you're stuck at home. And let me tell you, you goofballs, you are making some really great, really smart, and sometimes very, very silly podcasts. Like this one. What is this? Because of the Pesadilla Step Pause, I could find an acorn that you can actually take off its hat and put it back on. I have no idea what that kid was saying, but I love it. So this new show you're listening to? It's made by kids stuck at home with nothing to do for all the other kids stuck at home with nothing to do. From Pineapple Street Studios, this is The Kids Are All Home. Uh, and I think that was a big moment for us on, on the production side because all of a sudden we realized that we could make stuff. And we, we really did. We heard from hundreds of kids all over the world. Uh, we made the show for a couple of months. Um, and, and it really was a shift for us in how production and really how, like, uh, for lack of a better word, sort of like creativity could, could work in this time. Um, and we went on to start launching a bunch more shows that were still sort of in that moment of the pandemic. So. Um, I don't know if we need to listen to another trailer, but we launched a show called Doctor's Log um, with an ER doctor in the Pacific Northwest who was literally just coming home from the hospital at the end of the day and talking into her phone um, about the experience she was having. Um, and, and what we found was while listening habits were disrupted, people weren't listening on their commutes anymore, that there was a huge audience 
or these shows that were sort of meeting this moment. Um, Lizzie, what, what did you guys launch in the sort of early days of the quarantine? Yeah, so um, one of the shows that we launched um, was Hope Through History. And I think um, just looking at the two projects you just mentioned, Max, something I think we collectively did a pretty good job of was to your to use your words was meet the moment. And I think we had quite a lot of people out there that um, wanted to know everything about what was going on. And so Doctor's Log w was a really good piece of content for them to tap into. A lot of people wanted to figure out what do I do with these children that are home, um, that are meant to entertain, but also work at the same time. Um, and then we had a project like Hope Through History where we're really hoping to provide um, through the voice of John Meacham, a, a Pulitzer Prize award-winning um, a, a huge, huge person and a, a, a really powerful voice. How do we use this type of storytelling to allow people to feel comfort in that we've faced these types of things before and we've made it through? And so what we saw on our side, just from a consumer perspective, was we had people who wanted to know more, um, wanted to be entertained, wanted some sort of escapism. Um, and so, and also wanted to to feel hopeful. There was a whole lot of um, overwhelming news and content out there. And so we were also providing ways that um, were going to be impactful. And we found listeners really were seeking that out. And so, um, you know, to your point again, we did lose those commuting hours. Um, we lost those regular listeners that listened in the morning or listened at night. Um, but we also found when we put out really good content like this that um, these consumers were going to figure out a way to rejigger their day um, and, and find a way to listen to it. And so Hope Through History, um, we were in chat with uh, John Meacham at the time, um, and, and the goal was actually to launch the project that we just launched a couple weeks ago, it was said. Um, and but we saw this moment of we were all home. We were going through something that our country and this generation has never faced before. So we still had that project in the future. We really did want to take this moment and think about what we could put out there. And so we partnered with our friends at History, um, who took a lot of the responsibility of marketing it and making sure that this got out to a wide audience um, and really took, we were in the moment and reacted to the moment, I think, in a really positive way. Um, and so... Now we work closely with John Meacham, which is a, an incredible uh, privilege. And um, I mean, I, I won't speak as well as John Meacham does, so we might as well play the trailer for everyone. He'll definitely say it better than I will. Can we listen to that? There we go. Today, tomorrow, and for an indefinite number of days to follow, the world faces a terrifying crisis. But our country has been through hard times before. The influenza of 1918, the Great Depression, the Second World War, polio, and the Cuban Missile Crisis. And in each case, our national character has been tested. I'm John Meacham, and this is Hope through history. Together, we'll talk through five moments in time when America's leaders and citizens were forced to confront crises of historic magnitude, where we banded together and made it out the other side. Download and subscribe now on Apple Podcasts, Radio.com, Spotify, and wherever you get your podcasts. Were there challenges, Lizzie, with launching that show? Like, I know that you partnered with History Channel and you had Meacham, but was it hard to find an audience in this moment for that project? I think that um, because the content was done well um, and because we partnered with History, we found a way to cut through the noise. I think the biggest concern was how are we going to meet the sales marketplace and the ad marketplace in this moment where I think brands just felt very frozen. They didn't um, know 
is this the right time to advertise? Is this the right time to communicate a message? If it is, what is that message? And I think um, what we thought was going to be a struggle in, in helping to support it, um, what we what we did find is that the brands that did show up um, to be a part of this show wanted to. Uh, we encourage them to, um, this is a trusted voice that's going to tell a story of other difficult times in our country, but every single episode is going to end with a message of hope. And um, if you want to do the same thing from a creative messaging standpoint, here's a way to tap into um, an incredible voice to do just that. And so um, what we were worried about in terms of, will this cut through the noise? Will this do what we want it to do? Will we find brands we actually found it to be very successful and um now that we're launching it was said our second project we're finding that we're we're seeing a whole new audience show up to that to that show as well and so um things have settled down in some sense and in other sense they haven't settled down at all and so um when we're making other efforts to now launch this show um people are now reminded of hope through history or just learning about it again and so i think that this is a really great example of something that i love um in the work that we do is you can continue to find new listeners um and especially with content like this that is really evergreen we'll just continue to to find more and more people um and so the message is still hope through history and, and how do we have hope right now, which I think is really positive. Jennifer, some of the some of the original shows that we've launched since the kids are all home and Doctor's Log, like hey, can you talk a little bit about how that process has changed? I feel like there was this time at the beginning where we're like, this is a crisis and wild, and we need to put stuff out quickly that sort of meets that moment. And then it feels to me like sometime in late April or May that started to change a little bit. Yeah, I think it, it did start to change. And I think that now we're sort of at a place where there are certain shows that we make that I would love to be doing more in person again, the way we used to. But I think that we've also sort of found that um, some of our podcasts might actually just permanently be things that we are doing remotely um, where you know, maybe from the very beginning, we should have just sent like a pretty decent audio kit to a host and, and done everything that way. So um, it's been a weird way of working for sure. But in the end, and you know, and it's, it's not ideal. <laughs> um, but, but I think that we sort of learned a lot about like what we actually can do, uh, can do remotely, we were sort of in this weird place for a while where um, we had a lot of shows coming out where like, we, we do a lot of kind of big series. So it will be like eight episodes focused on one story, very kind of cinematic. Uh, and we had a bunch of shows that were kind of like um, three quarters made in, in like pre Corona times and then one quarter made after. And now we're doing some that are half and half. And so figuring out kind of like how to blend all the audio together and make it um, sound not too jarring uh, was a challenge at first, but I think we've really, we've really figured a lot of it out. Um, and yeah, we could, we could continue on like this for a while, though I really would love not to. <laughs> it would be very nice to see you both in person again soon. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a good hugger. I miss a good hug. We got to get back together. I know. I, I saw I saw Max recently, and I just like forgot that people had legs. It was just like crazy <laughs> to see it, like the, the like lower half of somebody I work with. So uh, yeah, weird times. Um, I wanted to let the audience know that um, you can start submitting questions for Lizzie and Jenna uh, at any time. Um, it's interesting too. I mean, I I don't actually think that we have. Uh, a slide prepared for it, but Jenna, we should maybe talk a little bit about when to change too, because I feel like, to me, that's sort of where it changed for us. We did a, we launched a show in April, hosted by um, Patrick Radden Keefe, and uh, it's a eight part, very deep dive into um, a pretty wild rumor that Patrick heard uh, out of the CIA, which was that they had. Um, the CIA was responsible for writing the song Wind of Change uh, by the Scorpions. If you haven't listened to the show, I recommend it. Um, and we had spent a year reporting that 
project. Uh, we've been to three continents for it, tons and, uh, tons and tons of travel. The show itself is really cinematic and we had wrapped reporting like in late February. And, um, and then we put the show out in April um, and it did fantastically well. And to me, that's kind of when things turned, like changed a little bit where it was like, we're not gonna be um, sort of like slapping together shows uh in quarantine but instead like this might be how shows are going to work for a while here um i don't know i don't have like a question about that that just felt to me like where it turned was when we put out this big kind of cinematic series and then yeah what started to happen was we started to hear from a lot of our partners netflix hbo places that couldn't make tv and we started to make more and more uh shows from them and now jenna we are currently making more shows than we ever have right yeah i think we're in in some like level of production on like um at least 15 podcasts right now which is <laughs> which is pretty nuts uh nor normally we you know we're putting out maybe like 15 shows a year um i think that we're going to be doing we do like kind of our own original series and then we do a lot of stuff with brands and partners Netflix, HBO, Nike, um, all sorts of places. So uh, most of them are kind of short series. And I think we'll probably do, yeah, like over 30 of those, um, probably from like this past March till, till next March, which is pretty wild. So uh, very prolific in COVID times, it seems. I, I think also like there's not much else going on. So I spend, I think like us and a lot of our employees, we, we spend a lot of time a lot more time working than we used to because um, I'm not going out at night. So what's there really to work? Lizzie, on the, on the sales side, mm -hmm. how, how, how did things evolve? Because I know that there were, yeah, sorry. I just mm -hmm. like walk me through how, that, how that's worked. I think what was really important to us and the way we approach business as a whole is every um, partnership, whether we're doing it on the content side or whether we're doing it on the sales advertising side is meant to be a partnership between both sides. And I think what we tried to do, and I think we were pretty successful in doing it is meeting every client where they were and where their business was. And so, um, and just being mindful of where they were in terms of um, how was their product affected, how was their business affected, um, how was their messaging going to be affected, um, and thinking about, um, okay, if you're a company that heavily relies on live events, how do we work with you to help you with your investment for it to make more sense? Because this is a long-term partnership, and uh, we want to figure out ways to keep things flexible right now. Um, so that was the very immediate reaction, like how do we do the right thing? for a partner that we want to be in, in partnership with for a very long time. Um, and we just really tried to be mindful of figuring out how to get creative uh, with each other. And, and just, it was a lot of phone calls and a lot of brainstorming and just a lot of collective creativity to figure out what was going to be best for each and every client that ha that was really being challenged with, with very different challenges depending on, on their business. Um, so on the sales side, that's how it was in the beginning. Like where do, how do we figure out how we can get through this very specific time that we were all going through. Um, what became, how it started to transform during the summer was a little bit what you guys alluded to on the content side as well. Um, TV production had stopped, video production had stopped. Um, there were really um, some negative rhetoric about social and advertising being placed on social. And um, what we always believed in podcasting, what, that it was a safe place, that it was an intimate place for brands to be in between um, these types of shows and the relationship between a listener and a host. What we always believed, I think we saw a lot more brands showing up to and being um, more inquisitive about what we were doing in the podcast space, especially with the lack of other options out there. So what I'm hoping for long-term effects as it relates to sales, now that we're starting to come out of some of it, we definitely see the turbulence of the market over the spring and summer has started to settle a bit. And I'm sure as soon as I say that, it, it's always, I'm very superstitious salesperson, but um, we are starting to find some balance there. And I think what that means for the 
for the long term for our business is we started to be able to talk to clients that weren't yet interested in podcasting or didn't yet understand podcasting. And because some of their options were taken away, um, they really took a hard look at, at us and our properties and our space. And so um, even just to start some very sh- you know, small or short-term partnerships, I think will really lead us to, to bigger deals for the future. Um, and I think just going back to the first point of doing the right thing for our our established clients in a time where we needed to do the right thing for them also will help us for the future as well. You just got a good question from the audience, uh, which I actually am interested to hear both of you answer. I don't think I could answer this for you. Uh, What are you most proud of in your work? Let's say like post quarantine. I think it's personal. Yeah, Jenna, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, right. Okay, I would say most proud of it's professional and personal. I think we all got thrown into this, like many of us have families with young kids. And I think uh, the whole work-life balance was totally turned on its head. And um, to be in a place where uh, family's healthy, family's somewhat happy, things look different, um, and we were still able to create really good work. I think just personally, I always want to do really good work work with really good people. And we're fortunate to be able to do that. So um, what I'm most proud of is that, that not only that we got through it, but I think we got through it and we did a pretty good job of doing that. Um, I think it's a, it's a total privilege right now to be able to be a part of content that serves people during this time. So we talked about hope through history. We also did a project with radio headspace, um, you know, years from now, when we're going to think about what people went through, it's such a wide array of the different struggles that people have had. And I think uh, the, the effect uh, on mental wellness um, has is, is yet to be determined how much and how widely we've all been impacted. And so to put out something that um, really was meant to to give people a moment to check in or to check out um, or to check in with themselves. Um, I think that we did that. And so just to be a part of that, even if it's adjacent on the sales side, um, was definitely a privilege to be a part of it. Maybe we should listen to that trailer for Radio Headspace. We've got it queued up, right? Jenna, that gives you a, ch- a chance to think about what you're proud of, too. <laughs> Headspace Hi, I'm Andy Puddicum, and welcome to Radio Headspace. I spent my entire life exploring what it means to be mindful, to be more present in the world. In fact, at one point, I got so carried away with it all that I even ordained as a Buddhist monk in the Himalayas. You know, as you do. If you recognize my voice, that's probably because you use the Headspace app. Either that or you're my mum. Hi, mum. Now, when I started Headspace with my good friend Richie 10 years ago, words like meditation and mindfulness, they were just a twinkle in the eye of modern day living. Thankfully, things have moved on since then, and these ancient practices have now found their way into our increasingly busy, connected and overly stimulated lives. And right now, let's face it, we need these tools more than ever. Now, whilst I possess no great wisdom myself, over the years, I've been fortunate enough to spend a lot of time with some of the greatest masters in the world. And my hope is that as a, as a friend along the way, I can share some of their wisdom in this new daily podcast. Now, the thing I love about mindfulness is that it doesn't ask us to believe in anything. It's just a framework for exploring life, for cultivating awareness, compassion, and all the other good stuff that we'd like to experience more of. So sit back and relax each day as we step out of the internal chatter, the external noise to pause, reflect, consider what brings us together in this shared human condition. What matters to us most? What matters to the people around us most? And how can we live a life that best reflects our limitless potential? So you know where to find this stuff. Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Radio.com, or wherever you're listening to this right now. And you can subscribe for free for a new episode of Radio Headspace. 
with me, Andy, every weekday morning starting May 11th. All right, Jenna, it's your turn. What are you? Uh, what are you most proud of in your work since uh, since quarantine started? I mean, we've made a lot of good stuff that I'm excited about. Um, but I think that I'm proud that our staff, uh, it still feels like we all kind of love each other. <laughs> um, it's Managing in the time of COVID, I think, has been the hardest part of all this. Uh, it's really just, it's tough when you can't see the people you work with every day. Um, and uh, all your conversations are through Zoom. Um, so we've been working really hard on trying to you know, keep our producers happy and um, and make sure that everyone has some some good time off and um, that we're you know communicating well. So I'm proud of that. Um, I think that's what. What about you, Max? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's good to that we uh, don't all want to murder each other. I think that's like something to celebrate. Um, and you know, I feel like. Um, I mean, I, I might be harping on this time in the end of March on the production standpoint a little bit, but, but my sense was that it was really unclear if we were going to be able to keep making work that was as good um, as what we'd been making, you know? And uh, I, I, I was really worried about it. And I feel like um, we've been able collectively both at Pineapple and at Cadence to figure out a way to do that. And, and part of that is is that, you know, the people who want to be hosting shows now, the sort of energy around podcasting just keeps increasing. Um, but part of it was that I feel like we sort of collectively decided that we weren't going to let this work suffer, even if we didn't have studios and offices to go to. And, um, and I feel like we did that. And uh, if you had told me in, you know, January, that we were going to not have access to a studio for six months and make more podcasts than we've ever made, I would have told you you were, you were insane. So, um, you know, yeah, I feel pretty good about the fact that we kept it, kept it going. It looks like we're starting to get a lot of uh, listener or audience questions, so please um, keep those coming. Um, when it just came through, it seems like a lot of people are dabbling in podcasting while they're home. Any thoughts on that or advice for amateurs? Jenna, what do, you, what do you say? Any advice for people who are trying podcasting for the first time? Um, yeah, I mean, I think of a lot of things. Um, but I'd say get a decent microphone uh, and position it well about this far from your face. Um, that's the thing that we hear the most going wrong in podcasts is that People have their mics across the room or they're just talking into a computer and it sounds kind of terrible. Um, so yeah, you can invest in a decent mic. It's like, you can get a pretty pretty good one for like a little over a hundred bucks. Uh, and I'd say just, you know, try it out, put the thing out in the world and see how people respond. Um, no need to, you know, be crazy precious about it. I think uh, podcasts improve over time and so, um, just kind of getting something going can be fun. And I, I would also say, I always tell people that, um, you should be able to describe your podcast in one sentence and it should be a, a relatively unique sentence. So something beyond just like I talk to people I think are cool. Um, something that makes it kind of unique and different, uh, the way that people really hear about podcasts, most of all, um, is word of mouth. And so when you're telling somebody to listen to a podcast, it's nice to just, be able to sort of quickly describe what it is. Uh, so um, come up with a sentence and let that kind of guide you through what the content will be. Anything from, from you guys about that? I feel like Max can answer that question best. He's the pro too. Uh, well, as someone who's very recently an amateur and is now a pro, <laughs> uh, I, my biggest piece of advice if you're starting a project yourself is to commit to doing it for a significant period of time. Um, so I think what we're starting to see now, I don't know what the number is, but I think there's over a million podcasts in Apple podcasts now. Um, and the vast, vast majority of them have like a couple of episodes and then, um, 
they stop updating. I feel like podcasts are becoming like what blogs were like in the aughts where everyone starts one and then every blog post starts with like, I'm so sorry, it's been so long since I updated my blog. Um, and I kind of feel like that's happening with podcasts now. And so I started a show, I guess it's not so recent now, like eight years ago, um, with a couple of friends of mine. And it actually wasn't much more complicated than what Jenna said. It was basically like, on this show, we talk to people that we think are cool. But we said <laughs> we're going to do it every week for a year, even if nobody listened. Um, and committing to doing that was really, really helpful because um, we were terrible at it for a long time. And I think if we had not committed to doing it for a year, um, uh, we probably would have quit. We probably would have stopped doing it. Um, and what happened, you know, around like month four is that we finally figured out to get decent microphones and how to ask decent questions. And then by like month six or seven, we started to find a little bit of an audience. And, um, you know, so that's my, my biggest piece of advice is it doesn't matter how often your show is coming out, but I would commit to making it for some extended period of time just to really give yourself a chance to be successful and and the definition of success i think is is really different for different people um but it's going to be tough to get there immediately and uh and you got to find a way to like keep going even if it doesn't seem totally worth it in the first couple of weeks uh, we got another question, Jenna, which I think probably you can speak to. Um, do you do any philanthropic work to help individuals in smaller, less affluent communities distribute their podcasts to broader audiences? I don't know that we do that specifically, but um, we've done a, a fair amount of pro bono stuff over the years that maybe you could talk about. Yeah, we have. Um, and we, we also uh, have a program where um, we like we basically opened up a program for um, for like new black podcasters who are just kind of getting into the podcast space to uh, where we do like a one-on-one a -on -one consulting thing that's between our staff and them. Um, and we've, we've worked with, and that's, that's all free. And we've worked with like over 150 people now on that. Um, and it's been really a lot of fun. I think that people have learned a lot and it's fun for our staff too. So um, we're really trying to bring new voices, work, like work on bringing new voices into the space. Um, it's it's still a new space, and I think that like podcasting, and there are a lot of audiences that haven't really had content made for them yet. So there's a, a ton of opportunity there. Um, and yeah, I mean, over the years we've we've done probably more free work than we should do. Um, but I, again, I think it's it's like we're in kind of an all ships rise moment in podcasting where the more people we can get involved and excited about it, the better it is for, for everyone. So, um, uh, if, if you need any help, um, with your podcast, feel free to email us. Uh, we have an email address on the pineapple.fm website and we will respond to you. Um, Feel free to keep uh, firing some questions at us. But in the meantime, I can just ask you guys some more questions. Where, where, uh, where do you think it goes uh, from here on the business side, Lizzie? Like, what, are the, what does the next year of podcasting look like? I think the next year in podcasting is going to continue uh, to change in the sense that um, we have a lot of clients that have found their way to podcasting um, and have really believed in what we originally set out to do, which was to align with really smart, talented hosts and um, allow the ad space to kind of creep in with the uh, host voice as well. Um, and we have had a lot of success there. And I think um, we are now also starting to develop um, pretty significant relationships on the business side in really more the digital world and the folks that are used to buying on the digital sense um, and being able to buy impressions at scale. And so I think what um, we'll see over the next year is um, things may sound a little different um, in terms of the way spots are produced, um, the way brand spots are produced, um, whether we continue to predominantly lean into the host types of reads or we start hearing some more 
more traditional type of commercials. I think that um, this time next year, we should have a very different um, portfolio as it relates to the volume and um, amount of clients that we see. Um, and it's gonna be interesting because I think execution will change as well. Um, and I think we all just wanna be in a place where we can figure out all the different ways that we can say yes um, to continue to, to grow the business on the revenue side. Jenny, you got a uh, prediction for where we're headed from here? So on the business side of things, yeah. Dealer's choice. I like the business. Um, the podcast business is in an interesting place now where um, ad sales used to kind of be the whole game for making money on these things. Um, but now we're in these kind of interesting distribution wars. So um, uh, there are a lot of platforms that are kind of trying to get into the space the same way that like a Hulu would you know, fight over something with the Netflix. Um, we're seeing that happen with, you know, Spotify and Apple and Audible and all these different places. So, um, so there are interesting kind of distribution opportunities for us. And then there's this real fun uh, kind of podcast to Hollywood pipeline happening now, where um, all of the stuff that we make uh, gets optioned for TV and film. Um, and I, we're just really excited to kind of see where that happens. We're staying involved in the derivative works um in some kind of creative capacity and i'm sort of excited to get a little more into the tv and film world um and didn't necessarily know that podcasts would take us there <laughs> oh, we just got one, more. one last question yeah. oh actually you know what well i think there's a we talked about some of this but i think the last question is is sort of um, you know, I think the three of us know that it's really hard for a podcast to be successful if listeners don't connect with a host. If you don't have a relationship with a host, I, I can't really think of a single show in which um, the show works, but people don't have strong feelings one way or another, usually positive about the hosts. Have you guys found in this time that developing that relationship between a listener and a host has gotten easier or harder? Has it changed at all? I think it's gotten a little easier because people are kind of so, you know, excited for, for like interaction <laughs> with other people um, because we can't have nearly as much as we used to. Uh, so it feels, I mean, it's always kind of felt like in the best podcast, like the hosts are your friends, but now it really does because we can't really see our actual friends. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so I, I think that like people seem kind of more, more excited than ever to hear a fun new voice, I would say. Yeah. And I think just to add to that, what I hope we're all getting to a place where we're realizing that more and a lot doesn't always mean good. And so, I even find myself watching Netflix, but also on Instagram and doing something over here. And just the nature of the way you need to engage with the podcast is inward and you're hopefully noise canceling headphones on and you can go in and engage and listen and focus in a different way um, than any other media out there. And so what we all think and know to be true about the space, I think more people have figured out as well. Um, and so hopefully it's just the beginning. That's a good note to end on. I do think that's right. I mean, it's a cliche, but, um, but it's a very intimate medium podcasting. And my sense is um, that this is just kind of made it even more so you know um everyone's stuck at home and in the same places and uh and that's where the podcasts are coming from too uh thanks to everyone for uh your questions lizzie jenna thanks so much for taking the time uh, thanks man I, I will talk to you both hundreds of times in the next 24 hours thanks everyone for having us Thank you for, yeah, thank you for having us. Bye. Bye. Bye.